So welcome everyone. Uh, good evening to our friends in Istanbul and good morning to, to those on the side of the pond. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Mehmet Toner, he needs no introduction. I'm sure everybody, is, everybody knows him very well. Well, very happy, really happy to have him uh, on this uh, Sabancı University seminar series. Um, a little bit of background on him, if for those who are not familiar. Uh, Dr. Toner received his bachelor's degree from Istanbul Technical University and then his master's degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology both in mechanical engineering. Uh, he later completed his PhD uh, in medical engineering at Harvard, MIT, uh, Division of Health Sciences and Technology. And he is currently the Helen Andres Benedict Professor of Biomedical Engineering at the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Harvard Medical School and Harvard, MIT, Division of Health Sciences and Technology. Uh, he is the director of research at the Shriners Hospitals for Children in Boston. And he's the co founder of Center for Engineering in Medicine and Surgery um, and the Biomems Resource Center at the MGH. His research involves uh, a variety of topics, including microfluidics, nano microtechnologies, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, and cryobiology. Uh, Dr. Toner is the founder of multiple technology, biotechnology and medical device startup companies. Uh, he has received many honors uh, over the years. He's a member of the Turkish Academy of Science. National Academy of Inventors, Na National Academy of Engineering, and Nation National Academy of Medicine. And most recently, he, he is the co-director of the uh, Engineering Research Center uh, funded by NSF ATP Bio. So with that, I welcome Mehmet Toner on your behalf, and we're happy to hear his talk. Well, let me share my screen. Uh -huh. uh, so before you start, I, I just want to remind everyone that you can put in your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box. Q&A. Uh, yeah. Th th thank you, Başak. Uh, thank you for organizing the seminar series together with Sabancı University. It's been a pleasure. Uh, to follow the seminar series over the last uh, uh, two months or so. And, uh, and thank you for inviting me as well. Uh, it's a pleasure and uh, with this new Zoom world, uh, life is, uh, certain things are better in life, uh, such as I don't have to fly all the way to Istanbul uh, to share some of our work uh, with you today. And, uh, but that said, I really miss coming to Istanbul as well. I wish this was in person uh, as opposed to in Zoom uh, interaction. What I would like to do today is just uh, focus my talk on what I call extreme microfluidics. I tell you why it's extreme. And on one uh, topic that we have a number of areas we are interested in microfluidics, but I will just focus on one, one journey, one story uh, in my presentation, just to give you a sense of the type of things we do in the in the laboratory, I just want to start by defining microfluidics. Oops, if I can go to the next slide. Yep, and um, microfluidics, as the name states it very clearly, is the science of manipulating tiny amounts of fluids. It started in maybe in late 70s, early 80s, and, uh, and uh, the push was always uh, uh, use smaller and smaller amounts and the fame and uh, recognition came from whoever could manipulate smaller amount of uh, fluid uh, on what we call microchips or microtechnologies using channels in the micron to 100 microns scale. And, uh, this was very good in uh, early 2000s when we interested in the field and, and started uh, to get into the field, uh, uh, being uh, localized in a hospital, a mass general hospital. And um, 
uh, we were interested more on what are they, these were good for mostly biochemical and molecular applications, but not so much for clinical applications, clinical applications of uh, very tiny amount of uh, fluids are very limited in many respects. And um, so we, the push was coming for, uh, you know, extreme microfluidics. Can we really do things that we do in microfluidics so powerfully in small scale, but do it in a way that we can deal with real world samples? And I have one in the middle here. Uh, this is uh, the, um, uh, uh, Rhone li uh, River uh, in, uh, uh, in, in France, uh, right next to Arve, and uh, uh, Arve comes from the glaciers and a lot of mud comes from there. And, um, and you can see two fluids next to each other, uh, they're so beautifully demarcated, uh, flowing next to each other. There are many examples of this in the world that you can see. It's, it's really, I love this photograph. And on the right, you see the cover page of a paper by George Whitesides, where seven different fluids uh, in the color, with different colors flowing right next to each other. So the, although you don't have the precision that you have in microfluidics in these large scale fluids, when you get to micro scale, it gives you an incredible amount of precision over what you can do uh, to a single particle. For example, if you had a fish on the Arve Riverside, you couldn't move that to the wrong uh, uh, Riverside uh, uh, simply, but you could do things of that nature in microfluidics. So we said, can we really deal with like the river, uh, real world sample, large volumes, dirty volumes, but do it with the accuracy, simplicity of uh, what we do in micro scale, like the image on the right, the uh, cover page of Science Magazine. And we have worked on a number of different things. And I, uh, what today I wanna talk about circulating tumor cells uh, and the journey uh, from that. The work uh, doesn't start with us. It goes back to uh, 1869 when circulating tumor cells, or I will call them CTCs in this presentation. Uh, Dr. Ashworth was uh, uh, in Monash University in Australia was the first to recognize the presence of circulating tumor cells. Tumor cells from solid organ cancers in blood. So you see the primary tumor uh, image at the time, the microscopy uh, did uh, uh, photography was an advance yet uh, to take pictures of this hand drawn. Uh, and you can see the uh, tumor nucleus and in, inside the nucleus, you can see the nucleoli and you see three cells in blood. Uh, this is a post-mortem 36 year old male patient and exactly the same um, tumor cells. So this was the first report that I know and uh, people said, okay, maybe the cancer is spreading across the body through uh, blood relation as these I'll shed off or slough off into the circulation. The key issue to remember, many people know one out of two men, one out of three women will have uh, cancer in their lifetime. Six uh, people, uh, one out of six dead in the world, about 10 million deaths are due to cancer. It's a devastating disease for that. And uh, most people don't know is actually cancer kills, not the primary tumor, it kills only rarely, maybe brain cancer and a few other things, but it's primarily the metastatic process, spreading of the cancer that's a deadly disease. And, uh, and you see an image of a, a patient here, as you can see all these black dots here, of course, except the kidneys, and uh, that's the natural imaging uh, contrast uh, agent accumulated there, and all these dots here are metastatic cancer. It's spread into the entire body, but it's usually asymptomatic. So you have no idea that this process is happening. And so the idea that we can find this process early on and, and we can monitor it as it happens is very powerful. That's why we are very interested in circulating tumor cells as well as uh, uh, others in the field. I want you to imagine some of the applications. I want to give you a few examples. Uh, so it starts from the primary tumor, uh, sheds into the circulation. This is what we call intravasation. And they, typically they are removed uh, from the circulation either by high oxygen, the immune system, 
and compliments, uh, but occasionally they can uh, go and find a niche to survive that's called extravasation into a uh, tissue and they grow, that's the metastatic side. If uh, you could uh, find these cells in circulation, they're extremely rare cells and they're one in a billion, one in a hundred billion blood cells. I will come back to that. You could do a lot of things. Uh, for example, there are a lot of new targeted and immunotherapies and they need to be individualized. They're toxic and expensive. Uh, you, you need to have uh, predictive and early response markers. Many cases, drug resistance emerges after a year or two. So you need to be able to monitor this. And early on, when the drug resistance emerges, stop the treatment, go to the next, save time, but also don't treat the person with a drug that doesn't work and it's also toxic. Early detection, of course, is the holy grail of uh, cancer. We could cure cancer in many uh, 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 cases if we could detect it earlier before it's the image I showed you that it's spread all over your body. And then there's the notion of personalized oncology where I can get your tumor cells test against the available drugs and options and then prescribe a drug that is uh, targeted and uh, designed for your own uh, cancer's needs. And so these are tremendously important applications uh, of uh, finding circulating tumor cells and using them as a tool to manage patients much, much better. One thing that most people don't know, I usually ask this when I uh, uh, do this in person, uh, but it's hard to do it in a Zoom call. And uh, there are 37 trillion cells, mammalian cells in human body of which 85% or more are blood cells. We are all walking blood cells. Organs and the rest of it, bones are a small portion. 37 trillion, about 31 trillion of your cells are blood cells. Within that, only one in a one billion or one in 100 billion blood cells are circulating tumor cells. So this is a very tall task. This is what I mean by extreme microfluidics. These are not real bodily fluids. A blood is a non-Newtonian, extremely complex fluid. I will go into more of the definition in a, a little bit later. And within that, you're finding, trying to find a very rare cell. So this is like a, you know, building the supercomputer of microfluidics. Can you, with a single cell precision, look at tens of billions of cells to find that one cell that kills people? The first, uh, we started this in early 2000, and the first paper uh, we published was 2007. And uh, this was Sunita Nagrat, a uh, postdoc at the time, a well known professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and a few other uh, uh, students in, in the lab. Uh, we developed the technology that we call uh, uh, microchip uh, CTC chip. And the technology, very briefly, it's about the size uh, of a business card. It's a uh, machine in silicon using deep reactive ion etching. It has uh, uh, these micro posts that are about 100 micron tall, uh, 20, 30 micron in diameter, about 100 thousands of these poles uh, uh, on the chip. It's designed from a microfluid mechanics perspective such that uh, the flow of distribution is controlled very precisely. And these posts are coated with an antibody that recognizes tumor cells, but not blood cells. So as blood goes through with circulating tumor cells in them, tumor cells stick to that. And I'll show you one video image of that here. These are, of course, uh, uh, we took tumor cells, labeled them fluorescently, spiked it into whole blood. And so you're looking at the, and uh, somehow my video is not working. I don't know why not, but, um, oh yeah, now it does. If I use the laser point, it doesn't work. And you see that uh, this is whole blood going from uh, left to right, and you can see how they stick to the, the sticky posts, so to speak. And uh, this one comes from right there, it's uh, caught right there. And so it's an extremely precise immunoaffinity capture device. So you could look at it. You can look at about one to two million cells per second. And here on the right, you see beautiful images. Uh, this is by Shannon Stott, who is a faculty at Cancer Center at Harvard now. And um, uh, you see these green ones are tumor cells. 
but some of them have pink inside. The only blue one is a leukocyte blood cell. The, this pink means that that cell is actually dividing. It's a dye for a dividing cell. So in the same patient, you can see two cells next to each other, tumor cell. One is dividing, one is not. We've actually used this as a molecular marker. I won't go into details of it, but it's not just finding these cells and counting them. That's really not that important. It's the type of information you can uh, obtain from these cells that's very critical. And that's where most of my presentation will be. For Let me give you one example. One of the earlier examples we did was uh, uh, in 2004, uh, it was the first paper published uh, uh, on tar uh, targeted uh, cancer therapy for solid tumors, not blood. Blood was published earlier, but for solid tumor in lung cancer. And the field was growing very rapidly in 2007, uh, 2008, when we are doing this study, it was already there were a number of targeted drugs, IRISA, gefitinib, erlotinib for EGFR mutations in, in non-small cell adenocarcinoma of the lung, crizotinib for MLK ALK, uh, translocations, and the experimental therapies at the time. Now, KRAS mutation is not experimental. We have a number of uh, inhibitors and then uh, other groups. So you take a patient group in the past, all these different patients, we gave the same drug. Now we could, based on their genetic makeup, put them into different bins, so to speak, and treat them accordingly. So this is called targeted cancer therapies. And this was a great application early on. And the big uh, uh, advantage we had, the person who invented the 2004 paper for targeted therapy is also my collaborator, Dr. Daniel Haber, who's the director of our cancer center. So we started working together uh, to see if uh, you couldn't do this. It's very difficult to do this from primary tumor because either the person's primary tumor is removed or doing biopsies in primary tumor in the lung is complicated. And so taking a blood, this to a blood test where you find the cell, sequence it, and then see if they have the mutation. And here you see from the original paper, uh, uh, Daniel Haber's paper in 2004, uh, treated, uh, patient treated with gefitinib, you see the tumor is filled uh, in this lung here, and uh, after weeks actually it just disappears. And so we could uh, look into uh, both the primary tumor in this study, as well as circulating tumor cells, and look at, for the EGFR genotypes where the there are about six, seven mutations in that genotype, uh, EGFR gene. And uh, we were able to find it and uh, uh, by sequencing the circulating tumor cells, it, uh, for the first time we were able to do something like this where you can monitor, serially monitor genotypes of cancer uh, in a single patient. For example, this patient had the deletion mutation in the EGFR, and I will come to this one later, T7. patients uh, develop this can you hear me now I think we got lost for a few seconds. Yeah, we, we uh, got lost for a few minutes. And where did we get lost, Pashak? Uh, do you remember? Um, just as you were describing the, the deletion T. Oh, okay, perfect, yeah. perfect. Okay, thank you. And uh, so the, the, the deletion uh, gene EGFR invitation, and uh, uh, you see when you give the drug, which is an inhibitor of that, the circulating tumor cell number comes down because the treatment, as you see here, is making the uh, cancer to disappear. At some point at 200 days or so, it comes back again. We know that after a year or two, uh, many of these patients develop resistance gene, which is called T790M. 
This gene in parentheses here was not present uh, at the beginning, but you see at uh, day 200, when we looked at it, now it is uh, highly significantly present uh, in the uh, patient, hence it stops responding. And, uh, and this patient was treated with a different drug and expired. But uh, you can see how powerful this could be if you could monitor a patient's genotype. There are not easier tests for this. When we did uh, this in 2007, uh, we did it from cells. Now you can do this from circulating tumor cells, but it's giving you a sense of how this technology could be used by getting, not just by counting, by getting molecular information that is uh, uh, clinically relevant. And um, the, uh, we have developed, the, made this chip much more effective. I won't go into details of it. We have done every single possible improvements on uh, putting nanoporous posts to get the cells closer to the increasing the sensitivity of capture. And we got to a point where we can actually, if we put one cell in 10 mil of blood, we can find it. And in 10 mil of blood, there are about 50 billion blood cells. So the sensitivity really went through the roof as far as the using microfluidics at a single cell precision, but processing a tube of blood, uh, hundreds of billions of cells with the accuracy of a single cell precision. So that was what was so exciting uh, for us to, uh, uh, to work on this project. And uh, the, but we learned things that we didn't expect also, and I call them not so pleasant learning. So not every learning is pleasant, but every learning is uh, exciting and important. We realized that these cells are very um, variable, heterogeneous. They are also dynamic over time. They change from even in the same patient. They uh, vary in geometry and make properties. Some of them are uh, proliferating. Some of them are covered with the uh, thrombocytes, platelets. Some of them go through EMT, epithelial mesenchymal transition. I will talk about that. Some of them are dual positive, so they fake you. Some of them are clusters. So we realized that to find the tumor cell in blood, to know something about the tumor is I we put antibodies on those posts. Antibodies were for epithelial cell adhesion molecule that's on the surface of epithelial tumor cells. Was not the right way to go because you needed to know something about the tumor to find the tumor. Then we said, can we turn this upside down and do it such that uh, we can get rid of the blood cells and then to find the tumor cells. And this is Dr. Haber, my uh, collaborator, as well as a few others, uh, Dr. Shamala Maheswaran, uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Kapoor, and Alicia Sequist. Uh, many people, the group is about 60, 70 people now. And uh, instead of looking in the needle, if that's the CTC in a haystack, can we get rid of the haystack to find the needle? Haystack is your blood cells, my blood cells. Your blood cells, my blood cells are identical. We have great reagents for them. The problem is in two tubes of blood, you have 100 billion blood cells and you're looking for one, two, three, four, five, whatever, 10, depending on the stage of the cancer uh, circulating tumor cells. Removing 99 billion, 999 million, 999,999 cells without losing one is a major task. So we said, that's called negative depletion technology, but how do you do that microfluidically was a big uh, issue. Nobody has done that before. And at the same time, we stumbled on this uh, very interesting observation. Uh, it's called inertial focusing uh, or flowing into focus, inertial migration. In fluid mechanics, for those who are uninitiated in the, in the field, if a particle's in laminar flow, orderly flow, a particle comes into a channel, let's say here, it comes out exactly in the same streamline. If it comes here, it comes out exactly in the same. Particles don't change location in laminar flow because it's an orderly flow. It turns out to be, I'm gonna increase the flow rate here as we go. And uh, you see every particle that come in, come out at the same location, but as we increase the flow rate, things start getting interesting. And you see there's a pattern. They are mostly in two locations, equally important. They are equidistant from each other with empty pa with, uh, patches in between. That, that is a function of concentration, but you can see how orderly it is. It's just amazing. 
This observation has uh, become very interesting. There are probably over 100 laboratories investigating, and we published this in 2007. And, uh, but immediately, as soon as we saw this ordering, we said, okay, if these were white blood cells, and if you put magnetic beads on them that have antibodies to bind white blood cells, then if I put a magnet here, I can deflect them because they are equidistant. Each particle in a very complex fluid now is they act in independent from each other. So I can remove those billions of cells without losing if this was my tumor cell. I can deflect this, I can deflect that, but don't have to lose this one in between in the process. And so that was the initial observation and or the Eureka mo moment. It happens occasionally in science. And, uh, and then we started putting that to use. And uh, the, just to give you some numbers, a vacutainer, which is when you go to physician's office, has 10 mil blood. Blood uh, volume of a human being adult is five liters. So we're sampling a tiny amount of the whole blood. Most of them red blood cells, they are small. Platelets are tiniest cells. White blood cells, CTCs are roughly the same size. And uh, so we are labeling white blood cells and red blood cells and platelets are small. And the white blood cells are now magnetically labeled. So the, we build a chip that uh, you see the design. I won't go too much into the details. I just wanna describe what the design does. It's parallel, it's, it's, it's symmetrical it's to increase the throughput. This part is a microfilter, which removes platelet and red blood cells by size because they are small. This side here, where we do that inertial focusing, you see the turn here. And so this is the entrance part. Uh, it, it has 256 parallel channels, th these tiny posts uh, that can be like a micro continuous microfilter that removes small particles, red blood cells and platelets from the rest. And then it comes to this region here where there are magnets underneath, so deflect the white blood cells. So we get rid of red blood cells, uh, platelets here, focus them, come here with magnetic field, get rid of the white blood cells and collect the, um, uh, collect the uh, tumor cells. And boy, Kyle Simet, uh, Ravi Kapoor's innovation team and many others put a lot of uh, brain power into making this chip to work. And uh, here you see the actual plastic chip manufactured by Sony uh, actually, it doesn't spin, but it's their manufacturing platform for CD rays. That's why, and uh, one of the key in, uh, people was uh, Emre Özgümer, who is a, a Turkish scientist uh, who's uh, now uh, starting his own company in another area. Fabio Fakin was another important, another Turkish person who worked on this is Murat Karabacak, who's a now faculty member. And, uh, but the, you see the chip, the blood comes here to product, the cells spend about a second on this chip. So it's extremely sensitive, extremely uh, gentle uh, way of uh, sorting cells. And um, we scaled it up through Ravi Kapoor's uh, initiatives uh, and it has uh, uh, tubes coming in and out. This black area is just to hold the tubes. There's a processor we, have to, we had to develop. So you put the chip in here push a button and it processes over the next half an hour to one hour. We do 3000 patient samples annually typically, and uh, you can process about 10 to 20 mils of blood. So that's two tubes of blood within an hour. That's about uh, 100 billion cells and it's about 30 million cell sorting per second. So in the United States of America, 300 million people, we can find one person in 10 seconds. So it's a very fast, extremely pre precise and doesn't kill the cells. So let me give you a few examples. This is one, because it's so gentle, you can actually get diagnostic quality pathology imaging. So this is fine needle aspirate. This is the primary tumor like the 1869 image. That's the melanoma cell, tumor cell. Do you see the nucleoli there? That's circulating tumor cells in circulation, nucleus, nucleoli. Exactly like that. This is Papa Nicolaus staining. You couldn't do this from other technologies because it's so gentle. You can uh, get the cells in their almost native uh, environment. And now let me give you another example. What 
makes CTC survive in circulation? This is a fundamental question for cancer. Why do they survive once they are sloughed off from the, are there molecular differences between primary tumor and circulating tumor cells that make them, I won't go into the details of it, but we have done a study where we have uh, isolated uh, uh, cells from primary tumor in an animal model, as well as uh, from circulating tumor cells have done uh, non-amplified sequencing. This was from a pancreas uh, model uh, of a um, uh, mouse model and sequenced it to look into differences uh, between CTCs, blood, ascites, as well as the primary tumor. What genes are different? One gene that came uh, up was always uh, Win2 signaling. This is an important uh, molecule uh, signaling cascade that's important in aging, cancer, stem cells, development, so on and so forth. But that was highly expressed in circulating tumor cells. In fact, when we went to patient samples, here you see a pancreas patient, we could see wind signaling almost in 50% of the circulating tumor cells. And then we have looked into the biology of this. What is it that wind to gives ability to a cell to survive in circulation, that a cell that's not supposed to be in circulation. I won't go into details of it, but uh, the, uh, it's through a, a molecule called TAC1, an expression of fibronectin, which is an extracellular matrix protein. So almost like a cell creates a fibronectin extracellular matrix around it uh, to uh, be able to send the right signals to the cell not to die. So you're almost faking the cell that it's you're not alone, you are not single cells swimming in blood, but you are still in a tissue. We are, of course, uh, this is an important information. You can uh, look into developing inhibitors and treatment modalities. Let me give you another example. And uh, this is uh, immune checkpoint therapy. Everybody hears it now, immune therapy. Basically, you're uh, uh, using the trick in the immune system uh, to attack the tumor and these are called checkpoint therapy. These are extremely powerful therapies. If it works, it's almost like cure. And, uh, and but how do you monitor? It's a very big deal. And you cannot monitor from DNA because it's, you have to do this at a, uh, um, at a protein level, RNA level. And so we looked at, the, in this case, about, I believe, uh, 19 different genes that are important in melanoma. I won't go into details of it too much. And then uh, from uh, the circulating tumor cells, uh, we do a molecular assay, look for these genes and create the, what we call CTC score. And we can, because it's a blood test, we can do this longitudinally. And you see the overall survival of this patient in a blue one are those that have a high CTC, uh, low CTC score, red ones have high CTC score, but they don't differentiate much. And uh, we have many examples of this, uh, they don't separate. So you can't tell much from that. But the power of looking at this longitudinally is ability to look at delta. If you look at delta between the two consecutive days and start plotting the delta, this is what we do in engineering a lot. We look at differential measurements. Suddenly you can, the same measurement, same data, you can separate from each other significantly. So you know this patient population is not responding to immunotherapy, but this patient population. So here in this patient population, you can go to the next uh, option on the treatment. So these are clinically very relevant and important ways of managing these patients that have not been possible uh, before. We have also looked into mechanism of uh, uh, metastasis. And uh, there are two uh, competing theories, uh, a more recent one called the EMT, epithelial mesenchymal transition. 90% of tumors, uh, cancer cells are uh, epithelial. And uh, when they go from epithelial phenotype to mesenchymal phenotype, that's when they get nasty, they, uh, when they spread, that's the underlying theory of EMT. And the other one, the earlier theory is this in the 1960s, 70s, and that there's these little embolus or clusters of cells are released from the primary tumor. They circulate because they are so big, they get stuck in some capillary and grow into tissue. So that's more mechanical uh, explanation of the metastatic process. 
No one could look at the EMT in patients because how do you do that with the circulating tumor cell chip and being so delicate, we were first time we were able to actually take these cells and stain for epithelial markers and mesenchymal markers. And uh, this is from a breast cancer patient, same patient, green is epithelial marker. So you see the cell on the left here is all epithelial, but same patient, a lot of these circulating tumor cells are also mesenchymal. And uh, so we looked at it and said, okay, can we look at the correlation with the patient outcome and the dynamics of EMT transition or epithelial mesenchymal transition? This is an index patient, very interesting circulating tumor cells. The patient responds to treatment, circulating tumor cell number comes down, stops uh, responding, uh, treatment comes up, uh, a new treatment, adriamycin, respond beautifully and then patient uh, unfortunately dies. What happened is actually EMT was operating. When patient had a lot of circulating tumor cells in circulation, it was all blue. Meaning is mesenchymal, blue here is mesenchymal. When the patient was responding, it became all epithelial. So it's the more normal phenotype, less cells, but also uh, more epithelial. And so it, uh, looking at this, you would say, okay, EMT is in, uh, operating, but to our surprise, and you couldn't predict this from the pr uh, first principles of biology, because you would expect to see no clusters in a mesenchymal phenotype. That's what happens. They become mesenchymal separate and go. And we saw just the opposite in these patients, that uh, those that are uh, very, um, uh, mesenchymal also had tremendously large clusters. So that provoked us to look into these clusters. And uh, this is from Shannon Stutt's paper in 2010. And then Aceto, uh, Nick Aceto uh, followed up with a beautiful study. I'll show a few slides later. And we saw these big clusters of circulating tumor cells with some lymphocytes in red here within that. What was very striking is that if you had cluster in your circulation during treatment, you did not do well. This is from prostate cancer patients. These results are now uh, reproduced by multiple groups around the world. If you have these, these patients uh, at least at one point, uh, clusters in their uh, circulating uh, tumor cells, these patients only had single circulating tumor cells. So that put a spotlight on the clusters. Nicola did a beautiful study to understand are clusters oligoclonal or they are single cells that come off and then divide in circulation. So it's clonal. I won't go into too much of the detail, but he, he labeled the cells green and red, put it into the primary in the animal model, looked at the circulation and they were always oligoclonal. So these cells actually circulate as a group of cells that come off from the primary tumor as a multicellular uh, system and then navigates and uh, forms a metastatic loci, and in this case, in the lung. Immediately we said, okay, if clusters are so important in this biology, can we build a chip that is specifically designed for clusters because the chip I showed you was not designed for clusters. We were by, uh, 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 in a sense, haphazardly getting these cells, but it wasn't designed for that purpose. This chip was actually designed by another uh, Turkish uh, uh, fellow in the lab, uh, Fatih um, Sarıoğlu, who is a professor at Georgia Techna. And if it's a brilliant idea. What he did is there were 33,000 of these tiny little triangular posts that are about 10 micron in size. And um, if uh, the, the physics of this is such that if a cluster comes here, if a single cell can squeeze through this maze, but a cluster by virtue of forces balancing, it's like a cantilever, it's a tiny little flow rate, will get captured in these uh, triangular mazes. And you see from a patient here, breast cancer patient, a cell, a cluster that was that's captured right here in this uh, structure, that's the middle triangle and two triangles leading to that. And uh, now with this technology, we were able to find more of these clusters to understand and analyze their biology. And people told us clusters don't travel. That's a really a, a myth. And because they can't go through capillaries, so we micro machine capillaries, this is seven micron, exact the same con flow conditions and put clusters 
into the system to see actually if they cannot squeeze through to cause uh, metastatic sites. Well, surely become like sausage and go through these capillaries. We are very interested in, uh, in uh, the membrane structure as it happens. This, uh, these cells are stained for membrane. You can see how they are sliding from each other to find their niche into the capillary and grow into that capillary. And uh, we have also put these into uh, zebra fish uh, because their capillaries are almost identical to human to show that it happens not in a, you know, machine capillary, but in actual system, you can see these clusters traveling through the microcapillary. So this was an eye-opening observation because people didn't think they could go this far. And we are, of course, looking to the physics of this, mechanics of this, how is it restricted? There is a very interesting behavior here. The cell-cell interactions are very important. We wanna understand which cluster are more pro, uh, proficient in uh, being metastatic. Those are that are weakly bound or strongly bound and how do they, so there's a lot of new investigations coming in this uh, area that we are very excited about. The cluster chip that I showed uh, is good, but uh, uh, it is very slow throughput. And uh, so we wanted to do this in large volumes. Uh, John Ed uh, uh, is developed a chip that uh, is a continuous flow. I won't go into details. Technically it's published in lab on a chip. I forgot to put it in here in 2020. We just published it. Very interesting uh, physics he used here. But um, here, these are time sequence of clusters going through the chip and uh, using the inertial focusing idea I mentioned, but in a distributed non-equilibrium way, too complicated to go into details. You could have these clusters uh, don't go through these holes, but if it's a single cell, it will go here. So it's almost uh, a filtration system that only clusters come out at the other end. You could also bin them with respect to the cluster size. And uh, maybe one of the most exciting areas is in uh, what I call precision oncology at the beginning. Can we culture these cells routinely so that we can test them against drugs for that specific patient? Here you see in a breast cancer patient, uh, we got the circulating tumor cells at day 20, it became 363. Five months later, we have these massive amounts and um, the culture efficiency was very low, six out of 36. This is 2014, we now have many more, we probably have uh, 50 plus uh, cell lines from patients, uh, but our hit rate, so to speak, efficiency is about five to 7%. That's not clinically useful, it's very low. You need to be in the 60, 70% at the least, and also it takes long time, and uh, you need to be able to do this within a month at the most. And, and I, I will talk about that a little bit later, but the, I want to talk only about the importance of this, how it could be revolutionary if one day we could routinely culture cells longitudinally from a patient as they are being treated to decide what treatment to give them. In other words, to give the right drug to the right patient at the right dose at the right time. And uh, in one study we did uh, in this study, what was really remarkable is that you couldn't do this from the primary tumor. Many of these patients had actually de novo or new mutations acquired during treatment, whether it's randomly uh, mutating or because of the pressure of the chemotherapy, they are mutating, we don't know. But if, for example, this patient had five new mutations that were not in the primary tumor, but it is present now in this patient in the circulating tumor cells. Three of these, pic 3 ca FGFR2, ESR1, are druggable. We have antibodies, inhibitors for these uh, mutations. We can block this. So we actually took these cells, put it in an animal model, and treated in different cocktails and conditions. We uh, treated uh, their um, um, PI3K uh, inhibitor and FGFR inhibitor at different doses, singly or together jointly. You see that if uh, these are concentrations, if you put both of the inhibitors uh, at a high concentration uh, for microgram, uh, micromolar, you basically kill the tumor. And we put this into animal and show that the uh, combined treatment kills the tumor in an animal model. 
We never do this because we never know what to do. So we give the same drug to everybody, one size fits all approach. So you can understand if we could turn this and make it work at the level that's needed clinically, how powerful it could be. We are, we are way uh, far from that reality, but it's an exciting research avenue for us and others as well. I won't go too much into details of this other than to say that we can also pick a single circulating tumor cell, do its uh, RNA se uh, sequencing of that single CTC and look at at single cell level molecular markers that might be important. In this case, we use uh, the prostate cancer patients that are uh, hormone resistant in this case, and, and, and some are treated with a drug called enzalutamide and some are naive, not treated with that. And we show that actually there's a big difference. Those patients that have, again, coming back to the same thing, wind signaling that I mentioned, those patients that have wind signaling actually express the, uh, the uh, androgen response uh, versus those that don't have it. So you can get a very specific molecular targets for treatment, uh, development of new treatment, but also to monitor these patients from single cell uh, sequencing. Let me finish by giving one more uh, example of a, a very kind of this is good. Uh, I think I gave you an example of each one of those initial ideas with the personalized medicine, using it as uh, for targeted therapy monitoring, immune, immune therapy. And, uh, but I wanna give you one more on the early detection. And uh, this is typically where we see patients, uh, it's too late and can we see a patient when there's a single nodule here it is, uh, and uh, at the um, mammogram in this case because the survival of the patients goes down. More importantly, people don't realize, it's not just the survival, the same drugs, chemotherapy, radiation, surgical, same tools we have today, doesn't work well here. It almost works like a cure here. So if we can push this to here, with today's tools, we could turn cancer into a chronic disease. And we'll check this in a liver cancer for a number of reasons, uh, but there are many people that goes from um, hepatitis uh, to um, 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 liver cancer within a year or two, a large population of patients. So you could do clinical trials and there are very specific markers for liver cells. So it's easier to find. So that's why we focused on uh, uh, liver cancer first to see if we could detect it early before it's uh, during the cirrhosis phase before it turns into a carcinoma. And so we took patients, a sample from liver patients, uh, processed, uh, isolated the circulating tumor cells, uh, created uh, um, uh, uh, RNA, uh, DNA, and thank, uh, did the digital PCR. Basically, we are looking. We were looking for about ten markers in this case. Ten genes each have many transcripts. So each one of these green dots here is a single transcript that you're looking. If the patient has a tumor cell in it because we lyse all the tumor cells, then we amplify all the signal for the 10 genes and multiple transcripts for each gene. Our signal resolution went through the roof. We could detect one tumor cell in 40 mil blood or 200 billion cell blood with this enrichment technology. And uh, you can see the signal here. The uh, uh, story of the, uh, the upshot of the story is, uh, if you look at this, this CTC score, we call it, uh, measuring whether or not the patient has the circulating tumor cells from liver uh, in their blood and serum AFP, uh, alpha fetoprotein, which is the standard test used. If you use the standard test uh, and uh, only, you will only pick one patient out of 15 patients. That's your resolution, 10%. On the other, if you use both AFP and RCTC score, you get all these patients, 10 patients. And, uh, and four of them you only get for, uh, from a, a circulating tumor cells, you don't get five of them. This is the initial study. Now we have a clinical trial going. This is Mark Kalinich uh, um, who did work and um, a graduate student. And uh, this is, more sensitive now in uh, being tested with large numbers in Taiwan, 
and uh, so the clinical studies are ongoing. But we get it; it's not great, but it's still significantly improvement and clinically very useful. The question I have is: it's the next direction. We are sampling out of five liter of blood only two tubes, 0.4% of the total blood volume. We are dealing with a rare cell and we have a sampling issue. Can we sample, uh, oh, and um, if we detect only 10 to 20% of early stage cancer, if we could isolate more cell, then we can detect more. We can increase our detection to 80 to 100%. If we can only culture, as I mentioned, only five to 7% of the patients, but if we get more cells, we can get this to 80 to 90%. How do we make the odds better for a clinically robust approach? And um, we are now going to leukophoresis. This is a standard clinical procedure that's done in uh, all the uh, cancer clinics. It's not a, a, a difficult procedure. You take blood from the patient, you put through a device that isolates the nucleated cells, which is white blood cells. and. Uh, tumor cells in this case, but it's not done for the tumor cell purpose, it's done for other purposes, for blood transfusion purposes. And then the cells are collected for sturge and the rest of the red blood cells, platelets, granulocytes are all given to the patient. So you're basically sampling the entire blood volume, taking the cells that you're interested and giving back everything to the patient. It's about 45 minutes to an hour procedure. So we have built, this is Avanish Mishra, who's a postdoc now become, uh, just recently bec uh, becoming a faculty member uh, at our center, um, brilliant uh, uh, engineer. Uh, I won't go into details of it, but I call this super uh, my CTC chip or ultra fast magnetic. It has such high magnetic field. The problem with this is that now your volume is you're looking at five liter blood volume. It's collected into about 70 milliliter and there are 8 billion white blood cells and many other cells. This is an extremely complex bodily fluid and making this work in a microfluidic chip at single cell precision is quite a task. And so you build this very complicated network based on our prior experiences. You see the chip here. He brought these black areas are actually ferrofluids that they bring the magnet right next to the channel. So we could have very high intensity and just published in PNAS. Uh, we haven't done patients with this yet, but I can tell this is the direction we are going so that we can get more circulating tumor cells so that we can better manage uh, these patients in the future. And uh, just to give you a sense, this is to replace biopsy with a liquid biopsy. A patient asymptomatic comes to you, you do a risk assessment. It could be a familial, it could be some genes, and, or it could be a coin lesion in the lung during a normal routine monitoring. You do liquid biopsy with a leukophoresis, so you collect a lot of these cells. And then uh, if there is positive, you do MRI as you will do now. And if uh, identify the tumor, surgical resection, and then you take the cells you collect from the um, um, CTC chip, you culture it as I showed you, but now the efficiency hopefully is gonna be eight to 200%. You culture it ex vivo, sequence it there for the new, new mutations. You provide the therapy options for the patient, you treat it, and then uh, hopefully the patient is cured or the disease is chronic. So that's the direction we are going. With that, let me stop. And uh, there are many people, I try to mention their names uh, during my talk, but the list is long. I'm not gonna spend more time. I uh, appreciate all the help and uh, wonderful work they do. This is a teamwork, but I especially thank our patients who are giving us blood and time uh, day in day out uh, so that we can move these ideas forward with that why don't i stop and uh, take questions thank you so much thank you so much it was it was excellent um so we have one question in the in the in the q a uh would it be possible to use the microfluidic chips to capture the exosomes Although the size of the exosomes are quite different than CTCs, maybe require a new design of the chips. Yeah, we we there are we have other chips. Uh, Shannon Stott works a lot on this area. 
and we call it the herringbone chip. Uh, there, um, the answer to that, yes, uh, but I wouldn't do it with this chip. We have other chip designs that would do that more efficiently uh, than this chip. This chip will be a little bit overkill and it's not designed to work in that as the person who's asking the question. Exosomes are small lipid particles that the cells uh, shed as a biological process. They contain a lot of things, mostly RNA. And it, it could be a wonderful diagnostic tool uh, to monitor these patients. And uh, so there's a whole field developed in the last uh, five, 10 years on analyzing exosomes and finding exosomes is a big deal. So the answer is yes. And there are probably better ways of doing than the one I showed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so one comment, I think, uh, from a student, I would only say this is the most interesting PowerPoint I ever watched. Thank you very much, Hojan. <laughs> Thank you, Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so please, please bring on your questions in the chat box and while you're doing that. I, I have a question. This is more like, you know, general application of this uh, technology. Uh, so where are you in terms of the clinical application? I know you're testing it, uh, you know, at MGH and maybe several other cancer centers in clinical trials, but when do you see this being widely used in all the cancer centers, like looking at the CTCs? And, yeah, um, it needs to be commercialized. That's not uh, what we do. We, uh, we are interested in a uh, on the uh, uh, lesion, unlocking ex exciting possibilities of uh -huh. the technology. Uh, most things we do are a single center mass general mm -hmm. uh, studies with uh, 2,200 patients uh, for each indication. And uh, some of them, it, it falls into three categories, technology development and uh, biological uh, fundamental studies and clinical applications. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, it goes into FDA regulations, FDA approval process, uh, and large-scale clinical studies. We are not uh, geared to give these devices to many people and service it and run it. And then they yell at us. They say, oh, it broke down. It didn't, it's leaking, what this and that. This is not what we do. There is a company that's formed that licensed the idea, that, uh, but it, it takes long, long time. Uh -huh. uh, the company hopefully will uh, make it commercially available. And uh, we are moving a lot of our attention now to the new thing, which is uh, can we go to Leukopack and find a lot of these cells, which could really make uh, things uh, uh, much better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's where we are focusing a lot of our scientific and technical interests mm -hmm. right now. But it takes time, anything to put into market it, it's a, a it's a big hurdle, and uh, my guess uh, we started in two thousand seven was the first paper thirteen years ago. The field kind of didn't exist uh, at the time. Now there are about maybe twenty companies. Mm -hmm. we, we are a little bit on the commercialization. We are actually behind there are other companies ahead of us on this area. So it's it's a growing area. It, it takes time. I would I would say. A few applications will come out if they approve over the next five years. Okay, thanks. So there, there are a couple of questions. In the Q &A. Yeah, I see. I see yeah. them. Can yeah, this so be used can... independently of tumor type? Yes, this is agnostic to tumor type because it's neg based on negative depletion. In other words, we're getting rid of the bl uh, blood cells to find the tumor cell. So that's the power of this technology. It's really agnostic to tumor type. So that's why we are so excited. And uh, what are the differences for CTC and CTC in the clusters in ter terms of RNA and protein expression? We do not know the answer to that. We haven't done a lot of uh, uh, study, but uh, what I can tell you, that what we know when, from a single patient, uh, if we looked at the single CTCs and cluster of CTCs and did sequencing to see what are the genes that are preferentially expressed in uh, uh, clusters and not in single cells? Uh, Plactoglobin was the one that was like 250 times more expressed. That's a, a, it's a junctional protein and uh, which holds the cells together, which makes sense. 
We also know that uh, clusters are more potent if they exist. So we are actually not developing inhibitors that will break down the clusters into single cells as a treatment modality. And, uh, and those results are actually coming out very nicely. And is it possible to use leukophoresis bases on this technology for treatment leukosis? Uh, it is, uh, is it possible right now our uh, leukophoresis is, a, uh, you could use that leukophoresis, right? You can do uh, leukophoresis somebody and then remove those cells and then give the rest or don't give the rest. And there are uh, ways they do that. It's a complicated procedure. We are, our next generation technology, which I didn't mention here, is that we want to actually, can we do a leukophoresis that is specialized? Remove whatever cell you want from the blood for whatever reason. It could be some infect, infection, it could be a tumor, and, and, and there are other reasons why to deplete certain cells in certain diseases from blood, but leukophoresis takes all the nucleated cells. So that's not uh, good. For the application that uh, this uh, person is mentioning, you need to be able to get only the cells of interest. That technology doesn't exist, but we are working on it. Is, is there more there's questions? Yeah, on. there's one more. Thank you for this. Do you have any plan to implant a chip to the patient's body to monitor cancer? Uh, uh, not really. I'm not a big believer of that for a number of reasons. First of all, FDA hurdles will be significantly big. Uh, the issue is really the field moved from counting these cells. People think that if you have the cell, oh my God, let's call to the doctor and uh, write my will. And that is not the case. The information needs to come from molecular analysis of these cells. For each cancer stage of cancer, there are different ways you can analyze and clinically different information is important, not just the presence of this. cell. That was about 30 years ago, just counting these kind of cells. And, that, uh, and so implanting something to say whether or not you have these cells and you're gonna have a lot of false positives, you're gonna scare the hell out of people. So my, I'm not a big proponent of it, but uh, some people are working on it and, and uh, um, we are not working on it. Okay. I think that answers all the questions that the audience have uh, in the interest of time. I, I just want to thank you one last time. Uh, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, right. Thank you, Bashak, for organizing this and uh, inviting me and others and uh, looking forward to the future presentations. And thank you to friends and colleagues at Sabanji University uh, for having me join them. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Oja. Thank you, Samia. Good to see you again. Hopefully <laughs> next time face to face. Yes, <laughs> I hope. So thank you. Bye-bye then. Bye-bye.